thank you. So uh, it's an honor that I was invited to give this lecture, which comes with the word distinguished. That made me happy. And I'll be talking about uh, the, this, this idea called the quantum universe, and that is meant to be an oxymoron. Universe is, of course, the biggest thing that we can imagine. But the word quantum means the smallest thing we can imagine, something even smaller than atom. So why do they go together in the title of a talk? And hopefully that becomes clear as we go, as we go on in, in, a, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this talk. So that's the reason why I came to Brookhaven. There's another reason. There is a, a conference going on with the title of Dark Interactions. And I participated in this uh, conference earlier today, and there will be actually two more days, uh, two and a half uh, more days going on. And looking forward to this. It's been actually very stimulating. But if you hear this idea that a bunch of physicists get together and talk about dark interactions, and some of you might get the idea that we look like that. <laughs> and you might even think that the whole laboratory is like that too. <laughs> and, and believe me, we are not like this guy. We are we're more like a, actually a little kid looking at the night sky and start to wonder all kinds of simple basic questions about the universe. How did it begin? What is fate? What is made of? What are its basic laws? And where do we come from? Why do we exist in it? And pick this last question here, uh, why do, where do we come from in this universe? Of course, it, it has been a question for the humankind for millennia related to religions, philosophy, and only rather recently in the history of humankind, like the end of the 19th century, we start to ask this question in a scientific context, for example, like in evolutionary biology. And I'm not quite sure if the evolution is going the right way these days. But anyway, so, so it became a scientific question. So to really understand where we come from, of course, we need a one particular kind of machine, namely the time machine. We don't quite have a time machine, but we have something very close to it, and they are actually the big telescopes and particle accelerators. So if we use big telescopes, and this is actually one telescope in the planning to be built at, at Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which, whose mirror is about 100 feet big. And if you have a big telescope like, like this one, then you can collect light coming from very far away objects because they are very dim. And if you look far away, the light takes so many billions of years to reach us, so you're effectively looking back into the past. So that's one way we can use telescopes as if it were a time machine. We can literally look into the past. But there's a limit to it. I will tell you why uh, in a moment. But there's a certain limit beyond which we cannot look uh, using these telescopes. So we have to come up with some other ways. And some other ways is to use these box particle accelerators. So the idea is very simple. Because universe started with the Big Bang, Maybe we can redo the Big Bang in the laboratory to see what it was like at the beginning of the universe. So the combination of these big telescopes and big accelerators actually turns out to be a very powerful combo for us to study the question, where do we come from? So just quickly go through sort of the power of these giant telescopes. This is a picture of Andromeda uh, using the Subaru telescope. We recently built a new camera for it. And it's a beautiful picture. And, and, if you, and so Andromeda is actually 2.3 million light years away from us. So if somebody there is pointing a telescope at the planet Earth today, what they're going to see is us in the form of apes, because that's how we look like 2.3 million years ago. This is the cluster of galaxies 2.1 billion light years away from us. So the cluster of galaxies is a little village made of uh, about 100 galaxies living together. And if somebody there is pointing a telescope at planet Earth, what they're going to see is us in a form of monocellular organisms. And this is the distant ever galaxy we have ever taken picture of. So if you blow up this region of the picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, this still doesn't look like anything there. But if you further blow it up, you see a little red smudge. And this little red smudge is actually a galaxy, which may have like a uh, 10 billion stars in it. And this is the distant ever one ever seen, which is 13.3 billion light years away from us. So if there is somebody in this galaxy pointing a telescope at us, what are they going to see? Well, nothing, because our solar system has not been made yet. So this is the idea that if you look far away, you can look back into the past. 
And now we are pretty much convinced that our whole universe is 13.8 billion years old. So if you manage to look 13.8 billion years, light years away from us, then you would see how the universe was like at the very beginning. And we actually managed to do so. And that's the picture of the baby universe we managed to take. So this is the picture when the universe was very, very young, 13.8 billion light years away from us. And so this is the way the universe looked like when it was very, very young. But it turns out that this is not the very beginning of the universe. There's something even beyond that. But unfortunately, we can't see it. This is sort of a wall. The reason is very simple. So when the universe was young, it was so hot and dense. It's like things inside the sun. And when you look up the sun, you can see the surface of the sun. But because sun is such a dense hot ball, the light can't go through it. We cannot see what's inside the sun. So it's the same idea. When you look 13.8 billion light years away from us, you want to look at the very beginning of the universe. But you can't because the universe itself becomes so hot and dense, you can't see through it all the way back to the beginning of the universe. So this is not the Big Bang itself, but it's the surface of the Big Bang. So that's the limit, how far you can see with any telescope we can imagine. That's the wall. Of course, when, whenever I start talking about the Big Bang, most people think I'll be talking about that one, but that's not the case. But rather, I'm talking about this kind of Big Bang, so the universe started out with a big, thick soup of tiny things called elementary particles. So that's the connection between the universe and the tiny things, namely quantum. So looking at the way the universe evolved since the, since the beginning, the universe has been expanding all the way for 13.8 billion years. This is you thinking about where you came from. And this is where the universe becomes so thick and dense. So whatever telescope you use can't go beyond that. So this is when the universe was about 380,000 years old. So what you can do to study the universe earlier on is to use particle accelerators to redo what was going on in the Big Bang itself. And we have already made uh, quite a bit of success in this uh, uh, using uh, this technique. For example, we know how the universe was like when it was only three minutes old. And the reason we know it is because the universe had a bunch of particles called protons and neutrons back then. And in the laboratory, we can smash them together and see sometimes they actually stick with each other and form something bigger. And this one is called helium, like what you do in balloons. So this way, you can tell how often these protons and neutrons can stick with each other and form a helium. And then you know how much of helium should have been made in the Big Bang itself. That leads to a definite prediction. The ratio between hydrogen and helium is supposed to be about 3 to 1. And lo and behold, if you use giant telescope and study the distant gas and measure how much helium there exists and how much hydrogen there exists, and that actually comes out to be about 3 to 1. So that actually works. So that way, we're convinced that we know how the universe was like when it was only three minutes old. So the rest of my talk today is how we might actually go about and study even earlier times of the universe since the Big Bang. So one question we have is about where do we come from? Well, where do the ingredients of us come from? We know we are all made of atoms. This is the picture of my daughter on a bad mood day. And she's made of atoms, right? And the atoms are made of atomic nuclei at the center. And these nuclei are made of quarks and, and new, uh, the protons and neutrons. We now know that these things are further made of tinier particles called quarks. But anyway, so the question here is, when Big Bang started the universe, a bunch of neutrons and protons were independent from each other. So how did it build up these bigger nuclei so that we can exist today? So that goes back to age-long question about the sun. Why does the sun shine? And it's interesting that we didn't know the answer to this question just until beginning of the 20th century. So it's actually a fairly recent time that we got to learn how the sun shine. And that is all thanks to the famous equation by Einstein, E equal mc squared. <clears throat> so this is the idea. What's going on inside the sun? is that you bring in four hydrogen atoms, or protons rather, 
<clears throat> and sometimes they would stick together to form a helium, sort of similar to what happened in the Big Bang itself. And this process has some byproducts called the positron, which is a form of antimatter. You know, antimatter is not science fiction, they really do exist. And also some very shy particles called neutrinos. And the point here is that if you put this on a scale, what you start out with is heavier than what you end up with. And you know, you would think this is crazy, right? So if you smash two cars against, against each other in a big car accident, you see a lot of debris on the ground at the end of the day, but if police comes and collect all the debris together and weigh them all, they know exactly the same amount as the two cars you got started with. So this is what we learn in school. There's conservation law of mass. But mass is not conserved here. You know, mass was heavier at the beginning, but lighter at the end, so mass is lost. And that actually turns out to be the, the reason why sun shines because it's converting this lost amount of mass into energy because mass is the same thing as energy. So as a matter of fact, our sun is getting lighter by four million tons every second. Of course, sun is incredibly massive, so it doesn't care that it's losing this much uh, uh, weight all the time. I wish I could do that, or turning some of my mass into energy, but anyway, so uh, this is what sun is doing, so that's how sun, the sun shines. At the same time, it's building up bigger and bigger atoms. But how do we know this is true? I told you just a few minutes ago that all we can see is the surface of the sun. We can't tell what's going on inside the sun. So how do we know this is true? Well, it turns out we can see what's going on at the center of the sun. There's this byproduct I mentioned called neutrinos. They are very shy particles. They interact very little with whatever else. So they can just zoom out from the center of the sun unhindered. So if you can see neutrinos coming from the sun, what you can actually look at is the center of the sun to see if this is really true. And indeed, there are tons of neutrinos coming from the sun. So as we speak, 100 trillion neutrinos are going through your body every second. Well, you might think that's crazy, we're inside the building, but I just told you that the neutrinos can just get out of the sun without any problems. They don't care that there's amount of concrete over here. Even during the night, when the sun is on the other side of the Earth, they just go through the entire planet Earth without any problems. So there's a huge wind of neutrinos shining on you every moment. Does any of you feel this wind? No? Whenever I ask this question in Berkeley, there are always a couple of people who raise their hands. <laughs> Okay, I guess uh, Long Island is more civilized place than Berkeley. But anyway, so do we manage to see those? Well, as I told you, they're very shy. So the idea is that if you build a humongous target, maybe there's some chance that these shy neutrinos would interact with us just a little bit. So one such experiment is in Japan. So this experiment is called Super Cameo Candy. And it's a huge tank of water. 50,000 ton of water in it. And with that kind of a huge target, maybe we can see some of these neutrinos coming from the sun. And so this is a big, big target. And, and the, uh, this little round thing is sort of an eye that can see the faint little light coming from any interactions of neutrinos. And they are actually pretty big. And you can also see probably these uh, uh, two poor graduate students working this experiment on a rubber shaft. And they're on a mission. Because the neutrinos are so shy, most of the time, the only thing you're going to get is noise. You need to make this humongous tank incredibly clean so that you can pick up these tiny, tiny signals of neutrinos in this huge tank of water. So this is what, they, this is what they're doing. They take a piece of cloth, a bottle of alcohol, psh, 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 and then wipe these eyes, the electronic eyes. Go to the next one. And they just go around this entire 40 meter diameter tank, come back, and then what they do is to fill a little bit more water so they can just go up one step. <laughs> and start doing the same thing. Go all the way around and another step up. They keep doing this for like three months to fill up this entire tank because it is this big. 
and actually people here and at Stony Brook are working uh, as a part of this experiment. And using this humongous tank, you actually do get to see these neutrinos coming from the sun. And that's how we know the sun is really building up bigger and bigger atoms as it shines and, and emits energy. So using this humongous tank, which is 3,000 feet underground, in pitch darkness, no light comes in, but they managed to take a picture of the sun using neutrinos. So this is not a photograph, but a neutrinograph of the sun. And not just that this is a picture of the sun, this is actually a picture of the center of the sun. So that's how we know this is really happening inside stars. But what about the other stars? Well, this is one example we could study. So one day, there was a big explosion of a star in a nearby small suburb called Large Magellanic Cloud. And that ex explosion also let out so many neutrinos that some of them got detected by the previous version of this water tank called Cameo Kande back in 1987. And as I told you, most of the time, what you're gonna get is the noise. So this is the noise. Zzzz. But for just one instant, there was a burst of neutrinos. Well, it's only 11 of them, but nonetheless, it's a burst of neutrinos. Something must have exploded, and lo and behold, astronomers did see this exploding star actually after this incident. So that actually earned Nobel Prize to uh, somebody named uh, Masayo Masatoshi Koshiba in Japan, but there was also an experiment done in the US where Maurice Goldhaber at this laboratory was the leader. So having confirmation from two independent experiments, you know, everybody believed that this was really coming from supernovae. And this is incredible, because first of all, the supernovae in our neighborhood in a galaxy doesn't happen very often, like at twice a century. So they managed to observe that. And, and, and even more so, now most of the time, as I said, you have to fight against the noise. So they have been actually trying to reduce the noise as much as they could, and they became ready only a month before this discovery. In addition, a month later, Koshiba was subject to the mandatory retirement. There was only two month window. So exactly 160,000 years before the middle of this two month window, star had exploded in large marginal cloud, which earned him a Nobel Prize. So you know, we learned that you need to have a tremendous piece of luck to earn a Nobel Prize. But we learned something. These distant stars, 160,000 light years away from us, you never go there and pick up the sample and come back, but we now know they build bigger atoms. So that's what we know. So from what we learned so far, the Big Bang made hydrogen and helium. First generation of stars was made of hydrogen and helium only, but as the, as the star keeps shining, it built bigger and bigger atoms at its core. And when it explodes, it releases these heavier atoms into empty space, and that becomes dust. And eventually, dust gets collected again by the force of gravity. There was a second generation of stars, further builds bigger and bigger atoms inside, and when they explode, it releases again these heavy elements back into space. So it is believed that our sun is the third generation, so grandson of the original star. That's why when the sun was formed, there was already plenty of heavier elements like calcium, uh, 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 carbon, iron, potassium, and so on, so that we could be born out of that. At the same time, it also produced a Nobel Prize, which is a good thing. But one thing is clear, we are stardust. We all came from stars. So this is part of the question, uh, and part of the answer to the question, where do we come from? Well, now that I talked about the stars actually finished their life with the explosion, you might wonder what would happen to our sun. Well, our sun is small enough, it doesn't literally explode, but something will happen when it comes to the end of its life. Because once it comes to the end of its life, there's an energy crisis, there's no fuel to burn anymore, the sun doesn't produce any energy, it can't support its own weight, so it starts to actually shrink. And on the other hand, outer part will start to, to uh, become bigger, so the sun becomes as big as the distance to our planet Earth, so it's gonna swallow us up. So that's the end 
of the life on the Earth as we know it. So one thing we need to make sure is that DOE will still keep supporting us so that in four and a half billion years, we have an escape plan. So we need to make sure of that. And there are places presumably we can actually escape to because now there are actually many studies looking for the planets outside the solar system. And already there are thousands of candidates. And very recently, the Prox Pro Pro Proxima Centauri, that's the closest star to us in 4.2 light years away from us, does have a planet which seems to be Earth-like. So presumably, there are places to go. And in these days, you can even picture some of the outer solar system planets. So you mask the, uh, uh, the, 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 the star itself because it's way too bright, it's a blinding. But by, by masking the star itself, you can actually take the images of the planets outside the solar system. So they really do exist. Maybe we can move to one of those things uh, sometime in the future. So that's part of the, the answer where we come from. Now we know where the atomic nuclei are coming from. But to build our body, we need something else, namely the electrons that move about this atomic nuclei to build atoms. Until recently, we didn't know why the electrons would happily stay inside the atoms. And the, we learned the answer only in 2012 when we discovered a new particle called the Higgs boson. And this new particle is discovered at a huge particle accelerator in, in, in Europe the called Large Hadron Collider. And, and they actually can put so much energy into space that would sort of redo the Big Bang in, in a very good way. And this actually happens in this uh, underground tunnel, which is 17 miles long in circumference. So it's a big, big tunnel. So the idea is sort of like a hammer throw. We just keep circulating some tiny particles many, many, many times over, and that will pick up speed. And eventually, when you release it, it can produce a big bang. So that's the idea of this accelerator. So if you go inside this underground tunnel, you can even perceive that it's actually circular. It, it's that big. Of course, the idea of accelerator may be sort of uh, 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 the, uh, not a very familiar idea to many people. Uh, 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 <clears throat> But uh, accelerators actually everywhere these days. Uh, if you go to hospitals for the radiation therapy or PET scan, uh, the, uh, these accelerators are actually a very useful thing uh, for those purposes. So there was this discovery of a particle back on uh, July 4th in 2012. This was long in the making. The initial idea that such a, a particle exists and, that, and this particle is stuck everywhere in the universe was proposed back in 1964, a half a century ago. People started to design this humongous accelerator like 30 years ago. And they started to build this accelerator and, and also detector uh, for, for detecting particles like uh, 1998. So it's been long in the running. And people at this laboratory has been also uh, playing a major role in, in the construction of the experiment for this particle accelerator. But anyway, that led to this very exciting, happy discovery of a new particle on the July 4th. And of course, you know, that's an independence day. So on the next day, we all celebrated the Higgs Dependence Day. So that was a happy moment. And it covered very ex extensively by media all around the world. And if you smash particles at an incredible speed and put in so much energy into it, many, many things come out of it from this uh, collision of particles. And you need to collect them all to see what was really going on. And to detect them all, you also need to build rather big instrument. So this is like a, the super cameo candidate kind of talked about put down sideways. And, and you can also perceive, uh, probably see the size of the human beings compared to the size of this instrument. So this is a humongous, humongous high-tech uh, machine. And, and this particular one is called Atlas. And as you know, the Atlas is a, a god from uh, Greek mythology. This is a god that actually supports a planet. So that's meant to convey this idea that this is really big. And Atlas is an experiment where people here have uh, may play a major role in, in building. What I actually got very impressed by is that people working in this experiment have been very conscious about trying to convey why we are doing this to the general public from early on, even before the construction started. So they created a video clip like this one. Just keep watching. 
that's pretty good, huh? So anyway, so this is the picture in the middle of the construction. And again, you see a guy sitting, uh, standing inside. I just appreciate the size of this instrument. And it's, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, Atlas, Super Cameo Candy, these are sort of machines or instruments, but they have some sense of beauty in them. You know, it's, it's, it's really strange, but human beings feel some sense of beauty in this kind of uh, mechanical device. As a matter of fact, this does affect it, the field of art. There was an opera done in Valencia in Spain whose stage setting was modeled after Atlas detector. So, you know, it does affect human beings in many different ways. But anyway, after this humongous thing had been built, this one time when the protons come together and produce a bunch of these particles. And this is the case when you did produce the Higgs boson. Unfortunately, the Higgs boson disintegrates right away into some other pieces. So what you see are the fragments. In this case, they are two pieces of light called photons. So Higgs boson was made at the center, disintegrated into two pieces of light right away. By looking at these fragments, you can tell what had been made at the center. So that's how this particle got discovered. So what does it mean? What did we exactly learn? So this is what we learned. When the universe was really, really hot, then there was Higgs boson all over. It was flying like crazy. And, and what it means to be hot, like a vapor coming out of a volcano, is that tiny particles are zooming about at incredible speed. So Higgs boson was doing the same thing. But when the universe became cold, what we know, what happened to the vapor, would eventually become an ice, cube of ice. And a cube of ice is made of water molecules lined up very neatly like this one. And that's what happened to the Higgs boson too. So Higgs boson froze in empty space. So it was a chaos at the beginning and then became very neat at the end. So this is what we call in technical terms going from disorder to order. So Higgs boson created order to the universe. When did that happen? Well, we think, we don't know exactly yet, but we think that when the universe became as cold as four quadrillion degrees, the Higgs boson froze into empty space. And that's how we exist. So our universe today is filled with Higgs boson frozen in. And when particles like electron want to go through this empty space, it's actually not empty, it's actually filled with this Higgs boson, gets disturbed, and slow down. That's how the electrons can happily stay inside atoms so that we can exist. So for, for some reason, if the Higgs boson evaporates in the universe today, then the electrons inside the atoms in our body start to move at the speed of light. So all of a sudden, we would evaporate in a nanosecond. So Higgs boson is what keeps us together. That's how we can exist. So that's also part of the question, why do we exist? But now comes the question, what exactly is this new particle called the Higgs boson? We don't quite understand it because it seems to be one of its kind. We don't see anything similar to it. And what I'm talking about is the idea called spin. Every elementary particle we have seen so far spins forever. It's like eternal top. Particles like electrons, photons, quarks, all of them are spinning forever. But to the extent we know, this new particle called the Higgs boson is the only one that doesn't spin. And if particle is spinning, you know, it looks different depending on how you look at it. So in some sense, it's got a face. But if the particle is not spinning, I feel like it's sort of completely bland. There's nowhere to notch on. It looks faceless and spooky. It's a very different kind of particle from whatever we have seen before. And, and you know, this looks so uncomfortable to me, talking about the new kind of particle, doing the most important job in the theory to keep us together. I feel so uncomfortable that I couldn't believe it when it started back in grad school. So soon after I got my degree, I ended up pro 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 proposing a theory called Higgsless theories. Maybe this particle shouldn't exist. But now that it's discovered, clearly I was wrong. So whenever I go to international meetings these days, the first thing I do is to apologize. <laughs> but it still begs answers to really simple questions like, is it the only one of that kind? Does it have siblings and relatives? 
And that idea is called supersymmetry in technical words. Or maybe it, it does spin, but it may be spinning in other dimensions we don't get to see. That's why we think it's not spinning, but it actually is spinning. Or maybe it's wrong to think it's an elementary particle. Maybe it's made up of smaller things. We don't know what is the right answer yet. Or maybe it's something totally different from what we thought about so far. And the most important question is, why did this particular particle freeze in empty space? We don't have answers to any of these questions. So we've got to study it further, and that's why we keep running this experiment called Large Hadron Collider. And the idea of these other dimensions, extra dimensions, might sound crazy, but we actually seriously talk about it. You know, everywhere in space we see in three dimensions, there may be tiny, tiny dimensions curled up in small sizes. And it, doesn't, it may sound crazy, but we know how it is like. So for example, on, on this guy on the, on, the, on the cable Golden Gate Bridge, this guy can go forward and backward. He doesn't go sideways. So in some sense, he's living in one dimension of space. But the little ants on this cable, of course, can go forward and backward. But they can also go around the cable. So these little ants see two dimensions instead of one. Tiny things can see more dimensions than big things like we can see. So it may really be that there are these tiny extra dimensional space beyond three dimensions we see today, and Higgs boson is spinning at it. That's possible. We don't know yet. So, so we have come to the idea that we were born from ancient stars, and also thanks to the Higgs boson that's frozen into empty space. So we need both of them. But that actually brings up yet another question here. How were the stars born? Without stars, we didn't make atoms so that we, can, we can't exist. Once you get to this kind of question, we are now getting into the mystery zone. Because the way stars were born is thanks to something called dark matter of the universe. We don't know what it is yet. So I tell you uh, the story about that. So first of all, how do we know that there are some mysterious things in the universe? Well, uh, that's because of pictures like this one. This is a picture, real picture, taken with a telescope. It's kind of cute, isn't it? You got two eyes, nose, the mouth, frame of face. Now, it, it looks so cute that I actually got given a given nickname. It's called Cheshire Cat, like in Alice in the Wonderland. But the question here is this. You know, these eyes and nose, these round things, are obviously galaxies. But what is this? And what is that? Something looks really, really stretched out. What is this thing? It's not only this system. We actually see tons of those. This is the picture I have shown you earlier, the cluster of galaxies, like two billion light years away from us. And, and, and again, you see these round objects. They are beautiful galaxies. But if you stare at this picture for a long time, you start to notice that they are these stretched out things. Also here, there. This is faint, but they're also very long. Here's another one. There's another one. What are these things? Well, it turns out that they can't possibly be a galaxy shaped like this. If there were, they would just you know, blow up right away. They can't stay together. So it turns out that these stretched out things is the ordinary shaped galaxies, but this mysterious dark matter is playing tricks on us to make us believe that it has this stretched out shape. So idea is this. So here's the cluster of galaxies, which has tons of dark matter in it. And there's a distant galaxy that from our point of view, it's behind this collection of dark matter where a cluster of galaxies is. It turns out that when the light is emitted from this faraway galaxy towards our telescope, the light actually gets pulled by the strong force of gravity here, so it gets bent. Doesn't come straight to us. So this class of galaxies then acts like a lens that would bend light. But the lens made by nature is not as nice as the lens we are using, for example, like for, a, for our glasses. So it actually ends up distorting the image of this faraway galaxy really, really badly.
So this is the way you can see it by the computer simulation. Just imagine that you have this cluster of galaxies with tons of dark matter in it, where gravity is strong, and there are many, many galaxies sort of flowing like river behind that, and then it should look like this. So when that faraway galaxy is behind dark matter, then gets really, really stretched out, but it's passed behind that, and, and goes away from this class of galaxies, they go back to their normal shapes because nothing happened to them. It's really that this foreground dark matter that plays trick on us that we think it's all stretched out, but it's not because it's so far away, nothing happened to it. So it still does have these ordinary shapes. So this is actually great. So we can see this mysterious dark matter in telescope directly. But if we know that it's playing tricks on us, then we can tell where the tricksters are. We can tell where dark matter is, even though we can't see it directly. So this is what we can do. So if you take some image using a uh, telescope, and forget about these really, really bright objects, they are nearby stars, they are blinding us, so let's get rid of those in your mind. And what you are interested in are these little dots, tiny dots. And they are all galaxies, billions of light years, light years away from us. But if you really, really look closely at them with a the modern technology, you can make the shapes and size out of those galaxies billions of light years away from us. Then you can tell they are slightly bent, distorted. Dark matter is playing tricks on us. And then you know where the tricksters are, so you can create a map of dark matter like this. So we don't know what it is, we can't see it, but at least we know where it is and how much of it. So this is the way we learned that actually 80% of matter in the universe is not made of ordinary atoms we are made of. It's made of something mysterious we call dark matter. We don't know what it is, but it's there. And people at this laboratory is trying to build the next generation of telescopes called LSST to basically make the map of dark matter for the entire sky we can study. So we will know where dark matter is very precisely in the near future. But how do we know this dark matter is not made of ordinary stuff? How do we know that? Well, this is one evidence for it. So this is a beautiful picture, again, for cluster of galaxies about 4 billion light years away from us. But you know, it looks like it's a very beautiful place. You might think you would like, rather like to be there, but it's, a, it's actually an ugly place. It, you should be glad that you're not there. So what is showing this picture is one cluster of galaxies and another cluster of galaxies which had a terrible accident. What's painted in pink is the ordinary gas, mostly made of hydrogen and helium, which became such a high temperature, had been such, such a, uh, became so hot that it's emitting X-ray. So that's how you can see where the hot gas is. What's painted in blue is where dark matter is. So we figure this out, again, by using the tricks they play on us. We know where the tricksters are, so we know where the dark matter is. But here's the problem. I just told you that the dark matter uh, exerts a strong gravity. But if, if it has a strong gravity, then why isn't the gas together with it? Why isn't also this hot gas together with dark matter? Why are they separated from each other? So after studying this for a while, people concluded that this is an aftermath of the collision of one cluster of galaxies and another cluster of galaxies at an incredible speed of about 4,500 kilometers per second. And we can actually redo this in a computer simulation. So both of these clusters of galaxies are pretty much made of just dark matter with the gas sprinkled in a little bit at the center. When they collide, the gas would interact with each other. They get heated up, get slowed down by friction. But the dark matter keeps moving as if nothing has happened to it. So that's why the gas lags behind dark matter. It's being dragged by the gravitational pull from this dark matter that's moving forward. So that's how we can understand this picture taken with the telescopes. So that's how we know that dark matter is not made of ordinary matter, atoms, because atoms would interact with each other, but dark matter wouldn't interact with ordinary atoms. It wouldn't interact with, the, with each other either. So that's a very mysterious object. 
But anyway, this system also quite a name because of this. It's called the bullet cluster. So what we have learned so far is that dark matter is there, but doesn't interact with itself, doesn't interact with us. So it's, it's very spooky. But even though it's kind of spooky, it's very important for us because this dark matter is actually our mom. What I mean by this is that oops, when the, the, the universe started with the Big Bang, it was almost completely smooth. But thanks to the, the gravitational pull by dark matter, the pieces of the universe that is slightly more dense than other parts has the more dark matter in it. And if you have more dark matter, as a stronger gravity that pulls stuff more in and becomes more dense, the gravity becomes stronger, that pulls stuff in more uh, strongly, and just keeps accumulating stuff. So eventually, there will be a big contrast between where it's dense and the way it's sparse. And where it's dense, there's so much gravitational pull of dark matter that pulls in ordinary gas in, and ordinary gas would interact with each other eventually, emits light, cools down, eventually collapses down to stars and galaxies, and that's how we were born. But in a computer simulation done by Naoki Yoshida, you can also simulate the universe, the wrong kind of universe, that doesn't have dark matter in it. So in that kind of universe, even 13.8 billion years later, there's nothing. There's no contrast, no stars, no galaxies, no us. So it really was dark matter that built stars so that we could be eventually born. That's why I said it's our mom. But we don't know who she is. In some sense, we got separated at birth. We really would like to see her, thank her, but we haven't met her yet. So putting all the story together so far, I'd like to use the video clip done by uh, George Smoot. So he is my colleague in Berkeley, who was one of those people who first take this picture of the Big Bang and show that there's a little contrast between dense spots and sparse spots. So this is what he did after he got Nobel Prize. I really admired the band, and so when they said we wanted to react to the Big Bang with the guys from your lab, I said, no way, I want the band. <laughs> okay, so, so now I gotta tell you what the Big Bang is so you guys can do this before the sun goes down. Okay, so the idea is everything in the early universe was packed together very densely. It may have gone for infinite. We don't have infinite people, so we just have to use what we got. And everything stretched. Right? Everything got bigger, and the further away you are, the faster you go. So we're going to want to start at the beginning with everybody packed, dense, and jostling around, and playing ra high tempo, rapid. One, two, three! Then at the mark, everybody moves apart, the people on the outside moving faster than the people on the inside, and there's a little bit of irregular motion, so miss some steps, okay? <laughs> I know you can do this. <laughs> Right? And then what happens is you're going to form, you're going to coalesce together in groups of six. Right? So you have to find six buddies. And half of you are going to form spiral galaxies. Three people facing one way, three the other. And you rotate slowly as you move out. And the other half form elliptical galaxies, which are round blobs that keep moving out. So now there's a brass section out there called tubas. They make a really spectacular spiral galaxies, a really big one, like our own galaxy or like Andromeda. So you guys get to be near the middle and you get to make a really cool, you don't have to run out so fast, but you get to make, you get to be able to orient where half is facing the other way and you get to rotate with a, with a sort of twist up. And you're like the centerpiece of this whole thing. Go to us. Great guys. So this is how we were born. But we have to remember, 80% of people there is the invisible dark matter. And thanks to them, thanks to the attraction to each other, the galaxies were born. George himself is standing at the center of our galaxy, which means he's a supermassive black hole, four million times the weight of the sun. But anyway, so that's how the universe uh, evolved, and that's how we came to exist. So dark matter is actually very important for us. And we don't know what it is. At least there are ideas. One popular idea is that the dark matter are wimps. Well, wimps in this case is sort of a monster version of neutrinos that can easily pass through a planet Earth. And WIMP actually is an acronym that stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. So they are heavy particles. They were born at the beginning of the universe when the universe was hot. 
and when it was so hot, there was a lot of energy, and E equal mc squared can turn energy into the mass, so that's how these heavy particles are born, and some of them are still left over, and that's the, at least the idea. So if this idea is true, then there are wimps all over. So there are something like a uh, 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 100,000 wimp particles going through your body every second, sort of like neutrinos. Again, you don't feel them. But we learned the lesson. We did manage to see neutrinos coming from the sun. Maybe we can do a similar thing by going underground. There's a picture when I was actually bringing my family into an underground uh, laboratory. And one of them done in the United States in a, in a mine in South Dakota, a former mine in South Dakota called Homestake. And people built a big sensitive experiment underground. And this is the picture taken at the completion of one such instrument. All the physicists are happily dancing to enjoy the completion of this instrument. And, and there are many others built around the world, like in Canada as well. So maybe we can eventually see dark matter by using this sensitive, large device placed underground, shielded from noise coming from outside. But people also try another technique. Maybe we can make it. If Big Bang made it, maybe we can make it too. So the idea is, again, using E equal mc squared, if you pump enough energy into it, then that, that may actually lead to, uh, we can make dark matter particles even when it's heavy. So can we make it? So the idea is very simple, right? So you accelerate tiny particles at incredible energy. And uh, the kind of particles we accelerate, like electron and proton, they are not very particles as we know it. So they're like tricycles, very light. But you ride it an incredibly fast on these tricycles to make it up to an incredible speed and make them collide so that there's a lot of energy into it. And then out of the collision of two tricycles, they come out tanks and airplanes. That's the idea of these experiments. And if one of the, one of the things, like a tank, is invisible to you, if it's made of dark matter, well, you don't see it, but you see the airplane coming on the, on, on the other side, so there must be something on the other side too. So that's the way we hope to see dark matter we make in the laboratory. So if that, that idea turns out to be the case, then we know how the universe was like when dark matter was born, which go all the way back to the point when the universe was a tenth of a billionth of second old. And we also would like to understand better what, he, what exactly Higgs boson is. And Higgs boson froze into the universe when the universe was only trillionth of second old. That's the way we approach the beginning of the universe more and more and asking the question, where do we come from? Of course, I have to tell you that we have no idea really what dark matter is. What I told you is just one of such ideas. We are talking about many other ideas at the conference we are having actually uh, this week. And some of the ideas tell us that maybe dark matter was born when the universe was this young. We don't know yet. We'd like to figure this out. But that really begs yet another question. What is this? What happened very early on at the very beginning of the universe? So there's an idea called inflation that actually stretches out the newborn tiny, tiny microscopic universe to an incredibly big macroscopic universe nearly in an instant. And, and why do we talk about that? Well, we also would like to understand yet another puzzle. I told you that dark matter built up stars and galaxies. But that's because there were slightly dense spots, slightly sparse spots. Dense spots collected more and more stuff. But why was there this variation between dense spots and sparse spots? Until you understand the question, we still haven't answered the question where we come from. We need that. And that's the idea, actually turns out to be this inflation. So the idea of inflation came from the study of the way universe is. This is actually a picture based on the real data. So now we can actually study millions of galaxies, measure the distances, shapes, and colors, and you can place them in a computer, and you can pretend that you are flying through it in this computer animation. So each galaxy in this, this animation is a real galaxy people have studied using real telescopes. But of course, if you want to fly through the universe at this speed, what you have to do is to build a spaceship that can travel about 10 trillion times faster than the speed of light. 
So unfortunately, I don't think we can do this. Don't try this at home. But anyway, so this is the universe looks like. The main point is, is that universe looks pretty much the same no matter how far you go. There doesn't seem to be any very special place. There are some dense areas, some sparse areas, but it looks all the same all the way through. If you make this into a two-dimensional map, it actually looks like this. There's a map of the universe. Each little dot is a galaxy. This is a two billion light years across. Again, there are some dense spots, some sparse spots, but by and large, just keeps going forever with no remarkable changes. But you do have these sparse spots. You do have these dense spots. There are some wrinkles in more or less uniform universe. Where does it come from? And this is where inflation comes in. So inflation tells you that universe started out incredibly small, microscopic size, even smaller than size of an atom or even atomic nucleus. And when the whole universe is that small, the laws of physics for small things come in, which is called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics comes with what is called uncertainty principle, which means everything's dynamic. What you think is empty space is actually a very dynamic space doing this kind of bubbling all the time. This is the way the universe was like when it was tiny because of the uncertainty principle. So the idea is the universe was born tiny. The entire stretch of 13.8 billion year, light years today was smaller than the size of an atom, atom, even smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus, 0 0.250 and 1 centimeter. That's how the universe started, with this tiny microscopic size. And because the universe is so small, there was an uncertainty principle at work that produces these wrinkles. And then, all of a sudden, this tiny universe got stretched to a macroscopic size by an incredible speed, which is like taking a, a, a one bacteria, and an instant later, instant, instant later, that bacteria becomes as big as a galaxy. It was an incredible stretch. And that stretch turned into these ripples at a microscopic size from uncertainty principle into this density variation at the macroscopic size. And that's what we saw in the picture of the Big Bang. They are slightly hotter spots and slightly colder spots that turn into dense spots and, and sparse spots in the dark matter that eventually built, accumulated uh, the, the matter that led to the, the uh, formation of stars and galaxies. So that's how we were born. That's what we think today. We don't know if this is true yet, though, because we haven't been able to prove if this inflation really happened. But we think we know what to do with it. If the space was stretched at an incredible speed like that one, then presumably the space, is spa space itself started to wobble. And space wobbling is what is called the gravitational wave. And gravitational wave was discovered earlier this year for the first time 100 years after Einstein predicted it, so we know that it exists. So maybe we can use this gravitational wave, this wobbling of space, to see directly what was going on when the universe was microscopic size. And so that wobbling of space can't be seen on the terrestrial scale because the wavelength of the wobbling is like 10 billion light years across. But fortunately, it may leave some imprint on this big light coming from the Big Bang itself. We have taken a picture of it. By looking at what is called the polarization of the light, maybe we can study this wobbling of space that was created when the universe was getting stretched from this tiny, tiny microscopic size to this huge universe we see today. If we manage to do that, then we'll be able to prove that this really happened. And inflation made this small contrast in densities from dense spot to sparse spot. And that contrast got magnified by the gravity of dark matter. That eventually led to dense and sparse contrast in the universe today. At the same time, you need ingredients to build up atoms. You need a Higgs boson to froze into the universe so that electrons get slowed down. And you need actually stars to build up the heavier and heavier elements so that you can produce carbon, nitrogen, calcium, iron at the end of the day. So that's how we came to exist. 
So the story I told you today is that universe really started small, and tiny things really mattered, and those tiny things let us to understand where we came from. So that's what physicists want to ask and understand. So the battle we are fighting is really to understand the mystery of the universe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your fun talk. We have time for questions. Yeah, so in this case, massive may not necessarily mean heavy. It needs to have mass so they can be slow. What we know about dark matter is that they have to be slow. If it's fast, it can't help us to build galaxies and cluster of galaxies because they will just stream out very quickly. So unless they are slow, they can't build, up us, build us up. So they have to be slow. And to be slow, presumably, they are heavy, and that's why we are saying it's massive. But we don't know how heavy it is at all, actually, at this stage. The good question. Where does dark energy fit in your, your picture? Well, dark energy is more about the future of the universe. So I didn't mention it, but if you look at this picture very, very closely, you can tell that universe is speeding up like this. And the dark energy is what is making universe to speed up today, which sounds totally crazy. Because when the universe starts with a big bang, like a big bang, and every part of the universe is pulling with each other because of pull of gravity, and that should slow the expansion down. But it's actually speeding up. That was discovered in 1998. So something is pushing it, and we don't know what's pushing it, but we just came up with a name, and that's what dark energy referred to. So the mystery there is there is something in the universe today that become, that's multiplying all the time so that it's increasing its energy. With it, we can actually push the expansion of the universe. And there is some that kind of crazy substance in the universe today. And how it was born, we don't know yet. How is it connected to dark matter, we don't know yet. So that's, again, a big mystery. So what we can do is, again, just do a better job in trying to measure how exactly the universe is speeding up today, and so that we can understand what's behind this expansion and what's pushing it. And hopefully, that would eventually tell us what the fate of the universe is. Does it heading to an end? Does it keep expanding forever with accelerated rate? Or does it start to slow down at some point? And all of these questions, we hope, can be answered by doing a better job of measuring the expansion of the universe today. And that's where LSST, the people here are working very hard on, uh, will come into play. I'm working on another project on Subaru Telescope uh, uh, right now. So hopefully, we will have some answers to the question sometime in the near future. Sony? Um, we hope not. Um, so, so the question is, if dark matter, uh, so that we know that dark matter gravitates. That's how we can understand this bullet cluster. That's how we can understand Cheshire Cat. That's how we understand why the galaxy had been formed. So we know it gravitates. But does it feel any other forces beyond gravity? And if it does, maybe we have a, a chance of catching it, or seeing it, or some, in some way detecting it directly. And that's the hope. And right now, we don't have any evidence that it does. But the idea here is that if dark matter was born in the universe, and, and it actually far less of them today, uh, as far as we can tell, so they actually uh, 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 have uh, reduced its number greatly from the beginning of the universe to, 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 to today. And when they start to become fewer and fewer, they must have turned into something else. And, and something else could well be us. So dark matter may have turned into what we are made of, namely atoms. If that's the case, there is some interaction between them. So that's where the hope comes from. 
Again, that's a hope. We don't know if it's true, but at least that's a good reason to hope why dark matter should interact with us at some level. I am already troubled. So the question is that this LHC experiment has been running already for many years and had, did discover the Higgs boson, which was great, but didn't discover anything else like dark matter. So is that a concern? I think it is a concern, but the truth is that we actually really don't know if dark matter is supposed to be here or there. So it's, it's, the, the, it's actually sort of a... a, a, a um, uh, really, a, uh, uh, the hunting we're doing, and we have to uh, uh, cast a very wide net. So looking for dark matter, ho hoping to make it at the LHC experiment is one thing we're trying, but we really do need to cast a very wide net because we really don't know if this is the place where we're supposed to find it or some totally different place we should look. So we basically have to look everywhere. That's the only thing we can do. Ah, okay, so that's a, a little technical question. So, uh, so I, I use this, this picture that the Higgs boson is really frozen into space, and, and that's disturbing the motion of electron, and that's how electron becomes slow. So that's the sort of particle picture. And, and you're right, uh, technically, what we have to do is to describe this, the frozen Higgs boson as a field, and that field is giving the mass to the electron, but picture itself is the same. So when electron travels through empty space, then it receives a little kick by interacting with the Higgs field here. And again, it receives a little kick by interacting with the Higgs field there. So it goes with a zigzag. And this is a picture in what physicists call position space. And if you go to a different picture called momentum space, this zigzag motion turns exactly into the mass of the particle. So this zigzag itself is the same whether you talk about particles or fields. So that part is still the same. Does that answer your question? Okay. There's another hand up over there. Yeah, so that, that's a good question too. So right now, we don't see it because universe does seem to be speeding up. And so the initial idea was the following. So again, Big Bang started with this Big Bang and everything's being uh, 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 pulled towards each other so it should slow down. And then it might actually eventually stop and starts to come together and goes to a point at the end of the day and that's the big crunch. But the idea of Big Crunch then hinged on the fact that universe is slowing down so that it will stop and starts come back down. But right now what we see is, is speeding up rather. So it doesn't look like it would stop and, and come back down. Of course, we haven't studied what universe would be like trillions of years from now, so we don't really know. But it doesn't look like the likely possibility for universe to stop and come back down. It may rather go to the, the situation that it's spinning so much, at some point, the speed of expansion becomes infinitely large, universe gets totally ripped apart and end at that moment. And that's the idea called the big rip, in, rather. So time for one more question. I see one hand over there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question too. And short answer is that I have no idea. <laughs> and, and a slightly longer answer is that, you know, to study what was going on before the Big Bang, first thing we need to do is get as close as possible to it. But as you get closer and closer to it, the universe becomes so dense and hot, at some point, everything inside the universe becomes infinitely big. And the minute you see infinity, the physicists threw their hands and said, we don't know what we're doing. And, and so what it means is that the laws of physics we have today don't work anymore. 
We need to come up with better laws of physics that we can avoid that infinity. With technical term is called singularity. And if you can manage to avoid that infinity to deal with the beginning of the universe, maybe you can tell what was be, uh, before then. And that's what people are trying to do with something called superstring theory. The idea is that if you replace every tiny particles, we think they are point-like, by a small piece of rubber band, got a finite size, then it would be crazy to think that universe is smaller than the rubber band because it's inside. So universe can't become smaller than that. That's the way you can avoid universe coming, crossing down to a point. Then you can avoid infinity inside. Then maybe you can tell what was happening before then. At least that's the hope. But this theory is still not finished yet, so people are still working on that. Thank you.